Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. This is Sports Fanatic News. I'm Joe Boric, and this is going to be the latest edition of the Royal Take as we check in on our Royals after Kenny got cab back for winning it against us on Saturday with a hat trick to beat the Wheeling Nailers. Um, we are going to be talking and reacting to that and previewing the game against the Indy Fuel, who picked up a very solid defenseman, which we'll also get into as well. But first and foremost, Hector, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, I really appreciate you hopping back on. Um, we should get you. Uh, we have to get you a cool Reading Royals background sometime. Now you <laughs> add it in your own background. Have it be like Satan Dare, like right by the glass or something. That would be pretty. That would be pretty yeah. cool. But um, as we check in on the teams of uh, our Royals now after victory, which goes to show how good they are. They lost three straight. One wasn't that close in a 10-4 defeat because of the power play allowing shorthanded goals against Trois Rivière. But the other two were closed games. And then they immediately get back in the win column off of the back of Flodell having a great first game going 27 for 28. And Kenny Hosinger getting his brother back with a hat trick, which puts them right back into first place. What did you think, one, of uh, Logan Flodell's first game with the Reading Royals, and two, of... um? just what Kenny Hosinger was able to do in the revenge against his brother, who, of course, won the game for them on Saturday in terms of wheeling. Now he gets it back with a full-blown hat trick. I think, you know, that's just good old uh, fashioned brotherly competition right there. He's like, oh, you're going to do one up on me in my place? He's like, I'm going to go over to your place and do one up on you. And he did it not just with one goal, but a hat trick. If that's not revenge, I don't know what that is. No, exactly. And also, uh, just for, so people uh, know, Cam Strong, if people did not know, for Logan Flodell, is the one that went back uh, in the Logan Flodell trade, uh, just in case people did not know that. Uh, coming from the Stingrays, who are a struggle bunny team that only have 17 wins, he's now obviously going to have a lot more ease and uh, less anxiety probably playing behind a team like the Royals as a rookie. And we, we kind of saw him settle in very nice and do what he kind of did in college at Acadia more so. than He was good with the Stingrays, but he seemed like his cool, calm, collected self uh, with the Reading Royals. I don't know if you got that sense as well. I feel like I got that sense, too. You know, you could tell like here, you could tell when a team's for you because the player doesn't t- pick the team. The team picks the player, you know, like. It's just a bond that you find, you know, and sometimes with some teams, you don't find that bond. And you're like, maybe I should try something else or hopefully I get traded to another team. Yeah. And also Cam Straw, I mean, he was playing really good in his rookie season. He, he was also a rookie. He was a rookie for a rookie trade. Um, he was playing really good in his rookie season. Then we moved on from him. But you got to trade good for good. I said that in the video when I did the reaction. So Dell seems like the perfect goalie, though, because. He's more in the category of, like, Levine reminds me more of a backup that can develop into a very good backup, where Flodell, from where we keep grabbing a few people from Acadia University, a couple guys in the Royals, they seem to be good at scouting people from there. He seems like someone that can be more of that um, solid starter that's more like the Christopolis of the world and not necessarily just that great 1B. Well, you always want to have that great 1B, which is if Levine becomes that, then he's a great second or third stringer. But I feel like Fladell's potential is higher. That, that's all it is. Definitely, yeah, I can agree with that. Um, where when it comes into overall uh, play tonight, we're playing the Indy Fuel. If, actually, before we go into that, let's talk about why we lost Tuesday's game, which um, is a rare, was a rare... Uh, occurrence of undisciplined play from a Royals, the the most or second most disciplined team, it kind of fluctuates back. But the one of the, let's just put it this way, the one of the top most disciplined teams in the ECHL, and they took eight penalties. If they took six penalties, mind you, they wouldn't have lost. <laughs> the last two penalties is what bit them in the butt. And then uh, Patrick Watling was able to score in overtime on the one power play there in overtime, which is even worse to give a team a power play in overtime because you have even more open ice because it's four on three instead of five on four. So um, I would assume that's your same uh, take from that game, but if you had any other observations that you think also could have led to our losing in that game, uh, definitely share them. 
Um, I definitely agree with you what you were saying on that one because, like I say, it, like uh, if you give up eight penalties, you're gonna lose. Like I'm gonna go back to the game where we lost on the 12th to the Lions. All the goals from the Royals were power play goals, and that's just an example of what goes to show you what happens when you give up too many penalties. Is you allow a team to get back in the game, and if you give up one too many, you're gonna lose. Yeah. And that, that that game, it was too, too many, which is even worse. <laughs> so uh, that that's what happened. But the Royals, um, that's what uh, resilience has kind of been the word for this bunch all season. Where to start the year, we had games and we talked about it in the first time I had you on, where I think, thinking about now, it might even been all the way back at the end of November, if not the beginning of December. But like we were more of a, we would still have those games where you would have those five minute stretches. That would be the reason we lost to the end, but we don't have those that much anymore because of resilience being able to figure it out. And that's what this team has kind of um, been all season. And also then uh, we don't have that as much anymore because the team's got more consistent after they use that resilience to kind of figure out how to win in all facets, whether it's being tougher, fighting teams and winning that way, body checking, winning that way, defensive bouts that we won against wheeling in times and against, uh, um, uh, Wooster um, and against Norfolk when we kind of pinned them at the line or against uh, Newfoundland even when we've been able to kind of smash them in the neutral zone. Like they found all these different ways to win games this year. And that's what I think is the makings of, like you said, the la- first time you won a Kelly Cup uh, contending team. Definitely. I can definitely agree with that. Uh, we we do still look like a Kelly Cup team because, I mean, just because we fall down don't mean we can't get back up. And they showed that on on Wednesday night that, hey, we're down, but like let's get back to what we're doing. And they'd be a really, really good Nailers team. Yeah. No, yeah, the Wheeling Nailers are a really good team. Uh, Cam is one of the uh, – Kenny's brother, uh, for people that don't know who I'm talking about when I just say Cam. Uh, Cam <laughs> it's all right. Is, uh one of the uh, best players in the league when it comes to scoring, Kenny's brother. And they were able to finally shut him down. And so the same with Watling, who's a very good player. They were able to shut him down on Wednesday when those two were kind of running wild in the game on Saturday and on Tuesday. So they, they were able to, again, use that stick to uh to adjust and come into a game and play a great final game and take three out of four points from a very good team in Wheeling and get revenge for them beating us up in uh, Reading. And so I think that was a very um, good win in the end. But when it comes to uh, who we're playing next, the Reading Royals, as I just said, are first in the division, now third in the league. you got Jacksonville above them with uh, the Toledo Wally uh, above the Jacksonville Iceman. And also we'll talk about a different team in Florida later for a different reason for people that don't know. But uh, we'll get to that later. Um, The Indy Fuel are seventh in the Central. But at seventh, they are almost hockey 500, 21, 23, 2, and 3. So that just speaks to, in most divisions, uh, minus the Stingrays at 17 wins. So does Norfolk. The South's a little bit different. In the Central Division, all these teams, and even I will throw in there the Mountain Division, all these teams are almost at the 500 mark throughout the entire division. So, like, you could say we're playing the last place team in the Central and Mountain, but you have to also think of it as we're playing a basically hockey 500 team. Like, you've got to come in here realizing you're actually playing a decent competitive team, not a team like um, how the South Carolina has 17 wins. Even Norfolk, they're competitive teams, but they have 17, 16 wins of the Swamp Rabbits, you're playing teams that are 20 or more wins. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you go into this game like, oh, we're going to play last place, and you have that like attitude like we're better, you're going to lose. Like, you need to go in there with this team is going to play the best hockey that they have played all season because they know we're a first-place team and the Kelly Cup playoffs are right around the corner. And that's what the Royals need to realize, that we're getting to like, we're getting to the to the end of the regular season. Like we're really coming down to the wire, and in a couple of weeks, like two months, it's playoff time. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Which is why um, getting this little bump in the road out of the way at this point is a perfect time to do it as well, and then get the 
get right back to the ground running as you play. We mentioned Indy, but then I mentioned who's in first. Well, the next set of games for our Red and Royals after playing the Indy Fuel is against that first place Toledo Wale team. And obviously you're going to need to play your absolute best hockey in order to beat the Toledo Wally. I wonder, I, I honestly think that could be the Kelly Cup final, a uh, preview of the Kelly Cup final right there in that, in that division. Yeah, you got a West team, you got a, it, it, it definitely could be, um, or a Central team, I should say, but you know what I mean. You got a Central yeah. team and you got a team that you got two teams that can play each other uh, in the Kelly Cup. I could definitely see that. Like you like, said, are coming to fruition where the Wally on the season have actually only allowed 123 goals against to 173 scored. The power play, 33 for 154, so that's all right. One, 111 for 139 on the penalty kill. Um, if we compare them to our Reading Royals, and then I'll do the same when it comes to the uh, Indy Fuel. The Toledo Wally, we both have the same power play percentage of 21%. Their penalty kills 2% higher at 80 to our 78. And they have three more shorthanded goals at five to our uh, two. And then 173 goals scored to 152 goals scored. So they've also scored more. Um, so, yeah, they're the team that is kind of, if the Royals can come in, and take it to them, that really shows how great this team is this year because they're the team that people have kind of put on the top of precipice. Where, yes, Jacksonville's starting to catch them now, but for most of the season, they've kind of been the outlier at the top. And then you have either Reading, you have Jacksonville, and then you have everybody else fall in where you're like, they're the team that will play them in the end. But this is Reading's moment to show they're not just going to maybe be the team to play them in the end, but have people start talking, well, look how good they played them in that regular season series. They might even be able to beat them in the end. This is going to be the game. In the ECHL, this is going to be the biggest contest of the whole weekend. Yeah. No, yeah, once we – yeah, I would say the – the game to watch, if you if you put it up as that, would definitely be uh, Toledo versus Reading because it, it's a preview, like you were saying, of potentially for the playoffs. Where Saturdays is at seven fifteen, and then Sundays a fourth year is at five fifteen. Uh, the start times for each game against the Toledo Wally. But if we go back now uh, to the Indy Fuel. They did add our opponent for tonight, the uh, last place in their division, Indy Fuel. Uh, added a pretty good defenseman in Christian Evers from uh, Rapid City Rush. Uh, he played for the University of Vermont. Uh, one of those, not really an offensive defenseman by any stretch. One of those just kind of does everything solid in the defensive zone. Not going to, like, wow you, but does everything solid. Uh, can hit guys off the puck, fight if he has to type of defenseman at 24 years of age. Um, he's a pretty good pickup, uh, I would say, for the Indy Fuel. But at this point of their season, I think this is a great pickup for them since they're still trying to retool and grow that roster at Hockey 500 in their division. But this isn't one of those moves thinking they're just going to all of a sudden contend. This is, like, to me, nice move to make because he might be a future cog of your defense, where with Rapid City, their defense is stacked, so they don't need somebody like Christian Everett. Yeah, I can agree with that. Definitely. Uh, Indy right now is probably just looking at one of those teams as, you know, in the rebuilding stage. And the Reading Royals are looking like they're more like, you know, we're going we're gonna to make a run at the Kelly top. Yeah. If you compare them. That's why I think uh, Evers is a perfect pickup for a team that's still building up um, because he's a guy that's going to continue to grow, um, has only played a handful of ECHL games. So he's, he, he's not even at his ceiling yet. So he's a perfect pickup for a team that is like uh, Indy and is still trying to figure out who is the next core of this team, uh, especially defensively. He's a perfect pickup for him. Definitely going to agree. Yeah, but let's see here. I'll do what I did with um, – with Toledo, with the Indy Fuel, and we'll go over their team stats, and then I'll do the comparison. So goal scored, they're actually pretty solid. 151 goals scored. 
the Indy Fuels issue, though, is 161 goals against, which is not good. Um, 34 for 182 on the power play is also terrible. 151 for 193 on the penalty kill doesn't sound too bad. The 78%, yeah, it's not terrible. Um, so they're one of those teams that scores enough. The problem is they don't defend enough. <laughs> and that's exactly why I said I think Christian Evers is a perfect pick up for them because they have to start to try to lock that up and if they do that then they'll be building good for the future but when it comes to Indy well it's just funny we scored one more goal than them you probably don't want to um you got to watch them like we had to with Trois Riviere shorthanded because the one thing the Indy few are great at they have 10 shorthanded goals this season <laughs> that's incredible so yeah you can't you don't want to let them go on the opposing rush um, and then our power play is 2% better than theirs at 21 to theirs at 19. And the penalty kills are literally dead even at um, both being at the 78 percentile. So I think those teams, uh, the Indy Fuel are one of the teams that are just kind of the makings of the division they're in, where they're, they're, they're kind of, if they, if they can have a good defending night, one of those teams that's actually better than what the stats show. It's just their defense. And at times goaltending, but primarily the defensive uh, issues and flaws have kind of cost them points. Where if you get them on a night that they're actually defending well, they have the offense to keep up with you. So that's why if you're our Reading Royals, that's why I was saying earlier, you got to come in with the same attack mode you come in against any other team. Against particularly a team like Indy that's in last place, because the only reason they're really in last place is, yes, some rough goaltending at times, but really because they leave guys open in too many high-octane spots. Yeah, that's crazy. But um, when it comes to Reading, though, as we wrap up, uh, I would say my question for you is on defense, since we last recorded, who's somebody that's really impressed you since then? And then as a forward core, who would be the guy that's really – stood out to you since we last uh, recorded. I think that's a cool thing to end on when we do these. I would say for defense, I would say, I would definitely say uh, Garrett McFadden. I think I said that correctly. Yeah, McFadden. Yeah, McFadden has stepped up a lot lately. and now in Yeah, I've seen him. Yeah, I've seen him step up a lot. And, you know, he's getting better, like, yeah, I could see him as one of the leaders on the team. Um, yeah, he's a he's another guy, a uh, young player that's a uh, rookie that's starting to continue to establish himself in the league. So I think the Royals, we're, we've kind of built this perfect mix of young and veteran, where you got the Garrett McFadge of the road, you go up back in, speaking of Garrett, <laughs> Garrett Cockrells, um, you got um, – Dominic Cormier, you got a youngster like Millman when he's there. You got, speaking of another Garrett, <laughs> Garrett Sasir that plays really well. Again, this is not me signing all these people. So it's not me that, now they're all great, but I think Kirk McDonald just has an affection for the name Garrett. Uh, but when it comes to, uh, when it comes to um, the uh, defense for me, a guy that's impressed me all season, because Patrick McNally, you know from his resume how good he's going to be. A guy that's Definitely. me all season is uh, Dominic Cormier, who seems to kind of like he's been good in past seasons, but never, ever near the level of this season uh, where he's had feeling out seasons the past three years. And now this year or the past or last year, I should say, he had a feeling out season um, and he played 33 games with Allen, seven with Wheeling, seven with Rapid City and then comes in this year. And he only and he was and he only had five points in thirty three. He comes in this year as twenty six points in forty two. It seems like Kirk McDonald's system of letting guys jump up on the rush and being more aggressive um, when they are able to, if they're able to get back, Cormy has been able to do that. And Kirk McDonald even told me when I asked him about it, he's been able to figure out instead of throwing pucks on net aimlessly about being one of the best defensemen. When I told asked him, like he seems like a ECHL John Klingberg that you can have a Game of Thrones army in front of the net and he's going to say, well, I'm still getting this damn fuck off the net, <laughs> where <laughs> not many guys do that, where he said that's the that's what Corms has got great at doing, picking up guys in front and going, this is the perfect time for me to shoot it there because it's at least going to create a great chance because of the traffic. So uh, he's somebody that's um, 
definitely uh, stood out to me when it comes to the defense. But McFadden definitely as a guy that's a rookie, Cormier's in his second season um, where he played for three teams last year, seems to have found his home with Redding this year. Uh, McFadden's doing great as a rookie. I definitely agree with uh, shouting him out as well. But what, when it comes to the uh, forward core, did you have anyone there that you that has st- stuck out to you since we last recorded? I would go for four words. I got to go uh, Patrick Bajabov. I think I said that correctly. Bykov? Yeah, Bykov, yeah. Yeah, Bykov. Well, yeah, he's our sniper. Um, he, he, again, had a weird season because he went great. Probably would have made the All-Star game with Pritch. Had a rough, I want to say it was November. And then started picking it back up again in part in December, and then has carried it through since. So like, yeah, I remember I was at the New Year's be, game. Yeah, to be like the points per game guy, he kind of started great, went a little bit down, and then turned into like greatness again. Which is so like his season. He's he was the perfect pickup though too, because the the Royals one of the main things they needed, similar to what the Flyers still need, is a guy that just shoots, shoots and, and scores. Uh, but he he's even took a next step because right now he's at 42 points. His career high in points before was 44 with Greensville in 1920. So he's definitely going to pass that. So Bykoff's even having a uh, career season for our Reading Royals. Somebody for me, that has stood out the entire season. Obviously, Pritchard has he made the All Star team, but that's a given. He's a given along with McNally. Um, Morrison came in. He had a feeling out process in the first couple games, and then after like two or three games, just went on an absolute tear and was like a two points per like a one point seven points per game guy for uh, until he got called up and played that cup of coffee until the Phantoms picked up Adam Johnson and then he came back down. Like the, he's a guy that came in. Talk about a rookie making an immediate impact. He came in and had that first play where he had that really nice move, um, where you were like, okay, this guy might really have it. Like, or not a rookie. He's a he's actually a third year player, but he's he's kind of at his rookie. He's only played twenty something game in the league before this, so he still hasn't even played a full season due to COVID and everything. But Uh. either way, like he. He came in, made that great move. I can't remember who we were playing, but when he finessed and got the backhand on goal in his first game, and you could see he had the offensive skill. It was just kind of getting into the groove and getting into the um, chemistry of his teammates. And now since he's found that, uh, I would say he's been one of the most dangerous guys uh, in the entire league since his points per game is .97. He's right behind Michael, who's at .98. So, uh, I would say uh, Morrison's been someone that I've I've loved to watch the entire season. Uh, I can agree with that. He he's done pretty good this year. Yeah, and then when it comes to goaltending, I think goaltending's easy. Goaltending's Zusty. Uh, Definitely Zusty. Yeah, goaltending is um, when Zusty's at his best. We saw that in nineteen twenty. Uh, we saw it this year. The Phantoms finally decided to win a game for him last night, so that was actually nice. Um, or wait a minute on Wednesday. So, <laughs> but either way, they decided, they finally decided to win the game for him. So that was nice for them to do that and not make him be the guy that gets no support. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's been great in that. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with him since of how good he's been doing and the injuries at the next level. Um, that's why I think Logan Fridell is my closing point was a perfect pickup because you have to have somebody that, I feel like he's a goalie that might be one of those rookies that comes in and maybe even does not, maybe not to the full level of Daniel Manella, who I made a video on in Tulsa, who's been one of the best rookie goaltenders this year, but kind of can come in, find a team that plays well around him rather than a team that's kind of screwed up and still figuring it out like his former team in South Carolina, and then comes in and just plays really well. I feel like that's why we grabbed him, because Hawkey's played really solid, but he's played more like a really good 1B with some of the goals he's allowed in, even though he has a great win and loss record. But like, and then Fladell might be that guy that's able to, uh, he's already at a 273 goals against, which is really good. And 899 save percentage is solid. Keep building up from there. He's the guy that I think we picked up to hope that we can kind of maybe use him as the ride the bootstraps guy 
if the Phantoms do end up keeping Goosey and or even if he gets a shot with the Flyers before the end of the season. So. I can agree with that. But again, Hector, I thank you for coming on. If you have anywhere that uh, you want to share with people to um, find you or follow you at, you're welcome to do that. Definitely appreciate you, man, having on me, having me on the show. And again, uh, and again, congratulations on being on the being able to work in the booth at one of the games. I remember I saw that, and again, I wanted to congratulate you on on your show for that. That's an amazing honor. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I thank you all for joining our latest edition of the Royal Take for Hector. I am Joe. This has been the latest edition of Sports Fan News, the Royal Take. Please continue to like and subscribe down below to keep the channel growing to 200 or more by the end of February. Peace out, everybody, and enjoy the hockey. Let's go, Royals.